Hello and welcome. I'm Pearl Chausenbauer, one of the co-founders and organizers of Undisciplining the Victorian Classroom. As one of the forms of content that we're generating for this site, these Zoomcasts are meant to be a mechanism that will allow us to stage conversations, to think together about our classroom practices and about our processes of learning and unlearning as teachers, how we can grow together as a community of scholars and learn from one another especially in moving beyond the boundaries of our field and training. In today's episode, Trisha Lutens, Josiah Miggs Distinguished Teaching Professor Emerita at University of Georgia, and I are reframing our first Zoomcast to discuss our recent shifts in academic positionality with respect to undisciplining and redefining the classroom. Please note that these reflections come from our own personal experiences. We don't intend to speak on behalf of others, and are sharing from the position of our own identities, bodies, institutional locations, and backgrounds as a way to spark thought and discussion. Great. I'm going to start and say that the last time we talked, we were both speaking as university classroom teachers. This time, we're not. Um, and so I'm going to ask you to start by talking about giving kind of the basics on your transformed relationship to the Victorian classroom. Yeah, it's been such a huge change for me leaving academia, being forced to leave academia really, because my institution, Notre Dame Vineyard University, has been, you know, struggling financially to stay open. And while they are still open, they've now become a graduate only program and online institution for the moment in the hope that they will, you know, enlarge their institutions again. And I felt that there really wasn't a place for me there to be in the classroom in the way that I wanted to. They, so I wasn't pushed out in the way they wanted to, to keep me there. They wanted me to become a curriculum director for potential new programs that we were thinking of developing, but I didn't want to be an admin. And I decided to leave higher ed. I wanted to stay in the Bay Area though. My husband and I realized that we did not want to be moving to the middle of the country and starting over, we like our place here and our family, our community. So I ended up taking a K to 12 job and I'm now teaching upper school English and teaching 10th grade and 12th grade at a gifted program here in San Mateo. I'm going to move in with my own story, which in some ways is oddly parallel to yours. And I think this has to do with this moment in history, probably um, very different positions. Of course, I had not intended to retire at this age. Um, I had planned to teach for much longer, um, not just hope, but actually planned. But because of the situation at Georgia, um, which has to do with COVID, has to do with university policies, has to do with the state of Georgia. I moved into a position where in order to keep my health, I was going to have to cut down radically on what I did. And I basically felt I, I was driven into a choice of either teaching well and giving everything else up or teaching badly or ceasing to teach in the classroom. Um, and that pause between ceasing to teach and in the classroom is pretty deliberate um, because one of the things that I think undisciplining the Victorian classroom has really brought home to me, especially since this transition, which is still ongoing, I only retired in January, um, is how permeable and capacious the concept of classroom is mm -hmm. and how at the same time how crucial it feels you know living in a in a context where state legislatures are 
increasingly trying to, from my perspective, invade and control the, the very particular kind of private public space of classrooms. I don't, I don't want to downplay the, the literal force of academic classroom teaching, but one of the things that I'm disciplining now, that, that the website now makes me, I've, I've been pushed to think about, um, is how I can continue to be a teacher. And you're formally continuing to be a teacher. So can you talk a little bit about that transition? The last time we talked, you talked about a pedagogy of radical care. Um, and can you talk about what that was and, and how that's been transformed? Yeah, you know, I think it's been really interesting for me. I, you know, I graduated with a job, with a tenure track job. I was only on the market once. I was really lucky. I received a few offers and I really felt like, you know, I, I made it. And then to get, you know, I was tenured two years ago and it felt like being, I use this metaphor all the time, just being, being given the, the job of a captain of the Titanic and realizing that even though logically we know that tenure doesn't really mean as much as maybe it did before, just to have that realization that it really is very tenuous. A lot of people, not only me, but in other institutions were on tenure, you know, we're getting fired or let go as tenured or tenure track professors. And I, I left on my own, but I was, I felt like I, I just couldn't stay there anymore in the way that I wanted to. It wasn't the dream job that I had. At the same time, even though it was my dream job, I always felt complicit in higher education because I was one of the few people who were still able to get a tenure track job and be tenured like that are, what is it? It's like, I think 70% of classes nationally are now taught by contingent faculty or um, visiting professorships. Like it's just, it's, it's such a problematic issue in higher education that I just felt I didn't have a power to change. What's really ironic is that as I was leaving higher education, we started Undisciplining the Victorian Classroom, and I'm now able to feel empowered in a way that I never did uh, when I was, you know, fully in higher education. So I, when I was feeling complicit and really powerless about that positionality, uh, it's, it's very different now. I actually feel like UVCs are making changes, in especially in terms of radical care. Like we are really making sure to help people who are contingent, who are independent scholars, who are not teaching in four-year institutions, who are not tenured or tenure track, and giving them the care that, frankly, higher education doesn't. And I, I think that really the face-to-face -face time that they have with our students is probably even more, more important or more, I don't know, um, tangible in a way, if that's the right word, to making a difference, especially for BIPOC, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. faculty. Yeah. And, and so I'm able to enter the field in a way that I think I wasn't able to, or make these changes, these, these real important changes in higher ed and in Victorian studies specifically to maybe affect some changes that I always wanted to change. Makes sense. Being outside of higher education also has given me a sort of a new perspective on how damaging higher education and like the, the pressures that higher education puts upon teachers from like from contingent all the way to tenured. I mean, I just think that it's, I knew it then, I knew it when I was in it, but I didn't realize that I was on the hamster wheel in the way that I was. Um, just the pressure to continue to produce and to be there for your students and service. It was just incredibly exhausting. And 
I, at NDNU with it as a teaching school, as a teaching college, I didn't even feel the pressures that other colleague, colleagues of mine feel in terms of getting tenure. It was actually a very easeful process for me. Uh, but I, had, I didn't realize that I was putting on all this pressure on myself until I've left. Yeah. And I can see it now. And I, I'm frankly glad I'm no longer in higher education. I'm, I'm not looking to return in any way. I just think for my health, where I'm at in my, um, I don't know, in my life, I, I, I just, it doesn't seem sustainable. And so I want to make those changes for, for people in general. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're thinking about having partly stepped out of, partly been pushed out of this kind of I want to almost want to say anxiety loop between productivity and privilege. Yeah. Um, let's come back to UVC. How does so it helped you in the past as at with the transition? Okay, is is I think what I'm understanding you saying. What about if when you think about the future with undisciplining the Victorian classroom on a per, on, starting on a personal level, um, how, how are you beginning to think about that or feel about that in, in terms of this site as a kind of resource for communities of teachers? I mean, I think that's really what the, for me, the magic of UBC is the community. So I think that's the key word for me. Mm -hmm. It's, Yes, I am one of the four founding, you know, figures of UVC, along with Ryan Fong, Sophia Sue, and Adrian Wisnicki. But our vision of UVC has always been beyond us. Yeah. So it's all about giving agency and empowerment to others who are frankly not voices we often hear in yeah. Victorian studies primarily for these reasons, because I think research is still so much more, I don't know, put on the pedestal above pedagogy and service and so forth. And um, with regard to contingent faculty or faculty who are in teaching in four-year institutions or non-tenured faculty, they don't have as much time to think about their research. I mean, actually most of their time is spent on thinking about the classroom. And we are actually a space now that provides access for them to, I think, to showcase how important the work they're doing in the classroom is. It's like justifiably as important as research, or it's like both. I think it there's like research, whenever we think we're intentional about our building of curriculum and pedagogy, especially in light of, you know, what we were, were terming undisciplining, just thinking about um, how race and systemic racism is really central to the kinds of classrooms that we should be building. Like this takes a lot of thought and research. And so this kind of pedagogy is actually, I think, so important to really consider as a uh, something that that needs much more um, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is just I think we we need to realize how important it is and um, make sure that the people doing this work is given the spotlight yeah. and also that, it helps them get a job because everyone still want, needs a job, right? And and so and also just um, shows people that there are scholars like this doing such important work that we should be thinking about too. I don't know if I'm I'm expressing myself clearly. No, I think I think you are, and and you know I have to say that having gone back to UVC as somebody who doesn't have an official classroom at this point. 
um, I think probably pretty naturally, um, I am suddenly registering the force of this project as a research project mm -hmm. in in ways that I that I haven't before. And I, I just really want to underscore, you know, the the point you're making about how this kind of teaching takes real research. Yes. It takes serious research. And I think that a lot of people um, in the past sort of felt a kind of panic, research panic. I can't do enough research to do this. Right. Um, and that was going to be particularly true for contingent faculty, for people who were institutionally vulnerable, right? Because yes. you're, you're out on two limbs at once in a way. Um, and so, yeah, that, that has, that, that has really, um, I've, I've found that really moving and I've begun to realize that in fact, as a researcher, I can't imagine at this point, um, starting out on a new project without checking UVC first. Mm. Um, that's really great to, to hear. And I think also, I, I, I do think that's so, it's so important to, think about the vulnerability piece because you know people who are contingent faculty often teach at multiple institutions at once they just don't have the extra time or or if they do it's they're they're not sleeping they're not taking right. care of their health in a right. way that they need right. to right just so that they could continue producing research that um, would be published in, I don't know, a journal for their CV or something like that, right? To get a job. Yeah. Even now, it's, it's, it's so hard. It's so nearly impossible to get a job. Like you need multiple books to even, you know, to even get an interview. I, I, it's just, it's just so maddening how um, our infrastructure of, of higher education hasn't been revised and changed. It's just so unsustainable. And, and then back to UVC, that's a space where people um, can publish actual researched materials that's not only useful for them, but for, useful for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's one, one part of our UVC is obviously to help people from this like radical you know, care position who need the extra care, extra help, but also to change the way just globally, nationally, we are teaching Victorian studies. We yeah. need to be thinking about other voices. We need to be thinking about uh, like decentering, you know, the, the canon. We need to really speak to the current times. We live in a post George Floyd world yeah. and 19th century studies really needs to evolve for us to survive yeah. and i think it's just responsibility the reason we started the reason i considered thinking even thinking about broaching you know adrian ryan and sophia with this idea with uvc was because i felt like victorian studies needed to really speak to what was happening in terms of you know blm movements and um, obviously, and you know, with um, Amy Wong, Ranjini Chatterjee's, and Alicia Kristoff's article, like you know, to make us think about and disciplining, like sort of from a research perspective. And we thought, I thought, well, we need to be talking about this in the classroom because that's actually where we are having as much impact, at, you know, with students. And, so uh, yeah, yeah. So what about what about on a personal level? Because we've talked a little bit about this, the 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 challenges in your case of negotiating your new range of kind of um, privileges and demands in terms of undisciplining your own classroom. So here you are. You're now in a in a very different context. Is this a you know, what kind of context is this for you as a teacher with your commitments? Yeah, well, I think we had, I shared with you that 
I mean, I think one of the big things that UBC talks about is the fact that as graduate students, we don't get this kind of training. So we have to do it ourselves. Like I, you know, I went to UC Davis. I loved my experience at UC Davis, but I did not get any sort of um, undisciplining my pedagogy training at Davis as a, as, an under, as a grad student. And when I started teaching at NDNU, NDNU is a Hispanic serving institution. It's um, a minority serving institution. It's like we have more, um, we, we have students who are just underserved generally. And so I felt like I needed to change the way I taught from the get go. So that was fall of 2015. I'm realizing I have a new student population the, the way that I was teaching uh, 19th century studies or just generally any, any of my um, repertoire had to significantly change. I needed to really think about differentiated learning and bring in more marginalized voices to actually speak to my students. And I, that's actually how I even got involved with this kind of undisciplining thinking because I had to do all that research on my own to get better as a teacher to serve my students. And what's interesting is the, the job at Nueva School, uh, I, I got that job, I think, because of my background in undisciplining. My, the 10th grade curriculum is post-colonial, decolonial thought. Cool. And uh, my 12th grade seminar this semester is on the afterlives of Othello. It's really centered cool. on you know, racism and the lingering effects of that. And so even though I'm now teaching at a school that's deeply privileged and that's really not diverse at all. And so I have sort of my own feelings of complicity in that regard, which is for a different conversation. But I feel like I'm being a much more responsible teacher in the classroom because I'm able to, to teach, you know, material that is like so central to UBC's mission, right? So yeah. it is, yeah. I, taught a, I taught, taught a Victorian serials class for seniors last fall at Nueva School. And I started with a politics of location assignment. And so some of my students were like, what does this have to do with Charles Dickens? And, you know, it was <laughs> with, uh, Braddon and, <laughs> And Wilkie Collins, and I said, you'll see. And then at, you know, so they, we started with them, you know, we, how, how are you coming in to this classroom on 19th century text? And then they realized as we were doing different, um, our lessons on location, on I identity and so forth, it's like, oh, now I understand why we have to start with ourselves. And that's something that I would never have done before if it wasn't for UBC. You know, like when I was creating my, I had taught my Victorian serials class at NDNU a long time ago, I think starting off, uh, and it was not undisciplined in any way. And I really was trying to focus on positionality here and also like how, yes, we're, we're centering on Dickens, Braddon and Collins, but we're also decentering them at the same time. It's like a spiral. Yeah. And yeah. I think that it's so important for us teaching 19th century texts to keep really doing that. And what's really um, been wonderful just working with the people we've been working with at UBC is like the, the realization that the, the, the BIPOC faculty who just had to think about this because they've had to have so much ideas that they bring to the classroom that we can all benefit from, right? Like that the whole discipline can benefit from. And yeah. Yeah. I, I, my, my hope is that, you know, UBC continues to grow and we, we talk about it amongst the four of us is like, you know, we, we don't see ourselves just being the front and center all the time because especially for me, and now that I've, I've left a higher education, like I would love for somebody else to eventually take that sort of center stage where they can actually um, benefit from this in terms of getting a job in higher education. And like, I don't need that. I don't need that help. Like with the kind of um, publicity and spotlight that UBC is getting, I would love for other people to benefit from that. Mm -hmm. And so we've, we've seen our UBC 
founders have seen ourselves sort of eventually having other people being central. We could be like editorial board or whatever and letting the, the legacy of the project continue as, you know, as time passes. I mean, you know, yeah. younger people will have more ideas than we did. So it'll continue to grow in this organic way that's exciting to me, certainly. That strikes me as kind of dramatizing the extent to which UVC is a teaching project. Um, and I, you know, I should say that I, I, I can imagine similar interviews with the other three people who are keeping this going, who've started this. And I think it would be fascinating at some point to have a kind of round table. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, I'm always thinking of things we're not doing, but, but that, <laughs> <laughs> that, that does sound marvelous. Um, and I, I want to, I want to bring up with that a kind of theme that I saw in y'all's wonderful introduction to your up and coming special issue. Um, at the, with the theme being that of kind of stepping back, getting out of the way. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah. And that's, I, on, on a personal level, I'm beginning to think that that's a, I was thinking of it as a, particularly in connection to retirement, whose way do I get out of? What can I make possible? Um, sometimes it seems like a dance. Sometimes it seems like I'm doing horrible things and knocking people over. It, does, it doesn't just seem like it. I'm sure it, it's, it's happening. Um, but it's more than that, isn't it? The, that getting out of the, that stepping up and then getting out of the way, that has a lot to do with teaching itself, I think. Mm -hmm. right. um, and so if you're thinking about the most challenging moments for you in terms of anti-racist getting out of the way, and it can be somebody not getting out of your way, or are you dealing with that? Are, are there things that immediately spring to mind? I mean, institutionally, just for sure, right? I think that's the most pressing thing. It's just, we have, our, our institutions are just founded on racist beginnings. And so yeah. even the classroom itself, I think the four walls, it's something that I've con con consciously been trying to push against our like the way in which the classroom is set up is actually our, it's like um, its lineage is, is church pews yeah. from, you know, from uh, England or even I think probably before as just one person in the front, you know, the priest teaching or or orating to the people who are just passive, passively, listening. And I think even just having classroom engagement really pushes against that, that I, tradition. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. And I, I mean, I have to say, we've talked a little in the last, um, last time we talked about Zoom experiences. Um, and uh, that would be another whole thing to discuss, wouldn't it? Because mm -hmm. the Zoom classroom is such a challenge. But on the other hand, um, there are ways in which because people's parents, siblings, roommates, kids, dogs, cats show up on screen, um, it brings home to me the, the degree to which often when the teaching works, um, you have whole families who are committing to this, including families of affinity. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, and I think also it just brings brings home that people are are whole beings right it's not just yes. the 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 people that you get in the classroom but it's it's their whole the positionality right their politics of location uh is really front and center in that experience i think also i think just having everybody especially if you have the the, the gallery where all, everybody's in small boxes it it decenters the teacher and yes. so we're moving yes. to like, you know, Paulo Freire's, you know, non-banking system of education where you really have to engage. And I think Zoom has forced people, I think if, if they were really intentional about it, 
to change the way we teach, right? It's like differentiated methods of teaching because you're evolving. And so if anything, maybe I would close with, with UBC just promoting the evolution of teaching in whatever, whatever way you see that. And we don't have to get stuck in these limited ideas of what teaching is and how we've taught it before. Oh, well, this is how I learned to teach <laughs> Dickens. So I'm going to teach it this way, which is just um, unsustainable. And it's just, we need to be evolving with the times and I, responsibly and ethically and intentionally. Yes. And we can do that anywhere. We could do that. Uh, you know, you could do that in your new, you know, your, no, your own new positionality. Um, I can do that at, at the high school level. Other people can do that at, you know, two-year institutions. I mean, like, really, we, we have to kind of stop thinking in hierarchies. And we have to really think about how to support each other in the best way for ourselves, but also for our students. Yeah. It's the yeah. only way we will survive, really. And and it's freeing isn't it yeah it's it's yeah. something that allows us to celebrate together as well as fight <laughs> yeah or maybe not even fight I me mean, i think that's for me what my problem is with you know the the job market is it becomes such a competitive space you go to mla you already feel the nerves and the anxiety right i think if you know, why does it have to be so competitive? And why can't we just come back to community building and helping each other out? Which I hope is what UBC is um, feeling for people, right? Yeah. That it is a helping, assisting kind of community. It's a community of love rather yeah. than hate. Perfect. Thank you. I think we're past our time. Um, this has been a delight. Yeah, thank you so much for suggesting this revisit and reframing of our initial talk. And I hope our viewers have found it productive in some form or helpful. And uh, yeah, I would love to continue this conversation maybe about Zooms, Zooming classrooms. All right, Sounds thank you great. so much, Tricia. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Bye-bye.